Uh, thank you, Dr. Cassay, and thank you, Miss and Jordy, for arranging uh, this uh, honor. It's, uh, it's a great privilege for me to be named, uh, given an honorary doctor at university. Uh, it's, uh, I take it as a recognition of, for the film work that I've done over the last 50 years. Uh, the problem that I have in speaking now is that Mers so well covered my life, my career, my thoughts, that I don't know what to say because she has uh, she said it all for me. Uh, so I, I, I don't know whether to contradict her, or to make something up, or just to keep quiet. Uh, uh, but uh, I'll try to find something different to say uh, uh, that I'll improvise at the moment. Uh, I, I think the model for my life, uh, the pretentious way of putting it, would be the metaphor for my life would be Las Vegas uh, and uh, roulette. Because everything, uh, so much of my experience in life is dependent on chance. Uh, uh, I had the misfortune after uh, I, 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 uh, I went to law school to avoid the Korean War um, because you could get uh, uh, deferred if you were doing graduate studies. It was a way of sparing the middle class from fighting. Uh, and uh, I hated law school and I read novels and poems for three years and never went to class. Uh, and um, after law school I was in I served my country in the peacetime army. Fortunately, the war was over. Um, and then I went to Paris uh, to write the great American novel, and I don't think I wrote one word, but I went around Paris clutching a copy that everybody who saw me could see the title called, uh, it was a book by Sartre called What is Existentialism, um, uh, which I, I read about two pages of and understood nothing. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, I ran out of money and for some reason or another I was hired to teach at a law school. I never understood why, uh, probably because they thought I would work for very little money. Um, and I, I taught law for a number of years and one of the things I, I was always interested in the movies and when I went, when I was in Paris I, I shot a whole bunch of movies and eight millimeter and super eight. Um, and one of the courses I taught at law school was a course on legal medicine. Uh, and uh, I took the law students on field trips to uh, uh, criminal trials and prisons and mental hospitals and parole board hearings. I, I, I wanted to take, I wanted to give some reality to the rather dry and poorly written appellate court decisions that they were forced to read otherwise. And I wanted them to see where their clients might end up if they didn't defend them properly. Uh, and uh, one of the places I took them to was a prison for the criminally insane. Uh, and when I finally couldn't tolerate being in a law school or the law school atmosphere anymore, uh, I, I, re I had reached the witching age of 30 and decided that uh, I should try and make movies. Uh, and uh, I first worked on a film that was half fiction and half documentary uh, uh, based on a novel called The Cool World. And it was in, in, in uh, I didn't direct it myself because at that point I'd had no experience. But in uh, observing uh, the people who were making the film, I, I've, it completely demystified the filmmaking process for me, and I thought if they could make a film, so could I. Uh, uh, and this, so I then started to make my own movies, uh, and this was well before there was a film school on every corner. Uh, and so when you wanted to make a movie, you just sort of picked up the equipment or apprenticed yourself to someone, and, Started make, start making movies, and so I, I, I knew the superintendent of the prison and um, asked his permission, and uh, much to my surprise, he gave me the permission, and then after about a year and a half negotiations, I had permission from the Commissioner of Correction in Massachusetts 
and, and made the film, which became Titty Cut Follies. And in doing the Follies, um, uh, I had the idea for an institutional series, and it seemed to me that the appropriate next subject after a prison for the criminally insane was a high school. Uh, and uh, I, I, I proceeded uh, pretty much on the basis of one film a year to do what has become um, an institutional series with no, with no precise definition of an institution since I uh, blessedly am not a sociologist. Uh, uh, it's really a place that has uh, physical limitations, a building or a geographical area, uh, and I, uh, whatever goes on within that uh, narrow or limited area is fit for inclusion in the film. And what happens outside it is another film, or certainly not fit for inclusion. The, the, you know, the, the metaphor is that uh, the institution serves the same function that the net or the lines do on a tennis court. Um, and the, the technique has remained the same over the years. Uh, small crew, with just three of us. Uh, I direct and do the sound, work with the cameraman, the third person when we shot on film, carry the extra equipment and bought, bought lunch. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't do any research ahead of time. Um, uh, because I don't like to miss something. If I'm there doing research and something great is going on, uh, I fear, feel near suicidal to have missed it. So the shooting of the film is research, uh, and, and the shooting is very instinctive. It's kind of a sport. You have to run around. You have to be in shape. You have to make up your mind very quickly. And all I try to do during the shooting is accumulate material with no idea at all what the themes or the point of view of the film is going to be. And, and the, the shooting period is varied from four to 12 weeks. Um, really, uh, in part, the length of the shooting is determined by how comfortable a hotel is where I'm staying and my wish uh, to get back home. Uh, and uh, I typically accumulate anywhere from 100 to, uh, in the case of at Berkeley, 250 hours of rushes. And, Berkeley was 250 hours because I noticed that uh, professors like to talk uh, and uh, it was important to, to shoot all of the meetings. Um, and then I, uh, the film, I really f try and figure out the film and the editing. Uh, uh, as I say, I have no uh, point of view toward the material or uh, no particular message that I'm interested in, in um, presenting. Uh, uh, I, th I think my films are non-ideological. There's a famous American ph philosopher by the name of Samuel Goldwyn um, who said, if you uh, have a message, send a telegram. Uh, and uh, that's a philosophy that I've followed in, in, in the films. Uh, and the film is discovered in the editing. Uh, the, the procedure is to, I, when I get back, from shooting, I look at all the rushes, set aside about 50% of the material after the six or eight weeks of looking at the rushes. Then it takes me six or eight months to edit the sequences that I think I might use in the film. And it's only when those sequences are in, in edited in close to final form that I begin working on the structure. And I, I make the first assembly in um, maybe uh, three or four days at that point. And that first assembly usually comes out to be within 30 or 40 minutes of the final film. And then I work on the uh, rhythm, the internal rhythm within the sequence and the external rhythm, the transitions between the sequences. But uh, most of film editing, or at least 50% of film editing, has absolutely nothing to do with the technique of, of, of movies, of cinema, as one says pretentiously. Uh, but rather trying to understand what it is that I'm looking at and, and, uh, and hearing. Uh, so that uh, the, the most important, or certainly one of the most important parts of making a film is deluding myself into thinking that I understand what's going on in the sequence that I'm studying. Uh, because unless I think I know what's going on within a sequence, I can't 
make the decision first whether to use the sequence, second, how to use it, in other words, how to compress it into a usable form, and three, third, where to place it in the film. And uh, one of the uh, most interesting aspects of filmmaking for me is that sort of analysis. Uh, and uh, I think I've learned most about that kind of analysis from the reading I've done. When I, when I was at college, it, it was in the late 40s, and, and we were t in, in English courses and poetry classes, we were taught something called the New Criticism, which was to study, uh, the, the essence of which is once, when one reads a poem, uh, you're not interested in the life of the poet or his traumatic experiences as a child, uh, or his relationship with his mummy and daddy, but rather, what is the evidence in the poem for what the uh, writer is trying to say? Uh, so uh, I was taught in university uh, how to do a close analysis uh, of a text. And I, I, what I try to do in the movies is to bring that same kind of um, uh, analytic technique, if that's the right way of describing it, to the study of the individual sequences. Um, and uh, one of the things that troubles me, I often, you know, I, I, one of the ways I make a living is by talking at film schools, uh, uttering my bromides about movies. Uh, and it, it, I find it very curious that often the students are much more interested in the technical aspects of filmmaking than they are in the content. Um, and uh, for me, the, the technique is at the service of the content, not the other way around. Um, and uh, I'm always, I, I'm, I'm always, in the film schools that I've spoken at, I'm appalled at the fact that the students don't, they seem to know a lot about the history of movies, uh, but they don't know, they haven't read much. Uh, and I don't know, I have no idea whether that's true in Spain or not. I know that it's true in, in France, in America, where I, I've met a lot of film students. Uh, and I, I think that's unfortunate and uh, in a sense, I don't know if it's a failure of, of the education system in general or a failure of film schools, uh, and I have no idea. I'm not offering this as a critique of what happens here because I don't really know. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'm asked what uh, uh, movies have influenced me the most, and I say, well, I haven't really been very much influenced by movies. I've been influenced by what I read. Uh, and uh, at the risk of sounding pretentious, the best book I've ever read on film editing is the letters of uh, Flaubert and George Sand, because when they write to each other about the technique, the, the problems they're having in writing, I read that as they're writing about film editing. Uh, I just substitute film editing for writing, uh, because I, th uh, I think the issues in all the forms are the same. Uh, the way they're resolved is different, but everyone uh, whether it's a painter or a poet or uh, uh, a novelist, uh, 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 playwright, we, we all have uh, the same problems in the abstract, the problems of characterization, of metaphor, the passage of time, uh, uh, of abstraction, uh, et cetera. Um, and when I'm editing a movie, uh, I always have to think of... Uh, my choice is being made with, with two tracks in mind. One track is literally what's going on, who says what to whom, what, what people are wearing, uh, uh, why does somebody turn left rather than right, why does somebody ask for a cigarette at a particular moment. In other words, I have to analyze the specific aspects of the behavior. Uh, but then I also have to try and think about whether successfully or not is not for me to say, what are the implications of the behavior that I'm observing and thinking about? And the implications, uh, what, what more general ideas are suggested by the specific encounters um, in the sequences? So that the final movie proceeds on two tracks, the literal track and the abstract track. And the, the real movie is where the literal and the abstract, the ladders that connect the literal and the abstract. Um, and uh, the, and the editing process really is a funny combination of being highly rational and highly non-rational or irrational, some might say, 
uh, uh, and I've learned to pay as much attention to the thoughts that the my associations, the thoughts at the so-called periphery of my brain as to the more deductive aspects. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I've had all the cliche experiences. I, I've thought of a cut in the shower, uh, walking down the street, I've dreamt a cut, uh, as well as deducing a cut from uh, a more uh, formal, uh, 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 straightforward analysis. Um, and the, 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 movie, the movie emerges from that, that kind of process. Uh, but I, I come back uh, a little bit to the question of chance, because during the shooting, for example, no events are staged. I have no idea what I'm going to find. Uh, I take an example. I don't know if any of you have seen Jackson Heights. Uh, but there's a sequence in Jackson Heights where a group of women from Alabama have come to Queens, uh, one of the boroughs of Manhattan, one of the boroughs of New York City, uh, and because they think the streets are dirty and they're there to sweep the streets and the streets are no more or less dirty than anybody else, but they're thinking they're making a social contribution to Queens by uh, sweeping the streets. And I, I thought that was rather funny and, and, and as we were shooting them uh, sweeping the street, the sidewalk, a woman came up uh, and uh, said she recognized their, uh, that they were from the South and were they Southern Baptists. And um, she asked them if they would offer a prayer for her father, uh, who was dying of cancer in the hospital, and she was about to go visit him. So suddenly, this group of street sweepers reconvened as, uh, as a group of uh, uh, religious uh, Baptists, and uh, the woman offered a prayer. One of the sweepers offered a prayer for the father of, uh, of the woman who approached them. So it, it turned out, it, 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 I mentioned that sequence because it has some of the elements that are, that I, uh, it has the element of luck. I just happened to be there when, the, when they were sweeping and the woman came up. But also it's a very sad sequence because of the history of the story of the father who's dying. It's also a very funny sequence uh, in my mind, because you know the, the the ignorance and the provincialism and the stupidity of women coming from Alabama to sweep the sidewalk of Queens, uh, but that chance aspect of, is characteristic of a lot of the uh, what I consider the best sequences in the film. There's another sequence in Jackson Heights. Uh, uh, we were driving along, and I saw a sign that said "Taxi School." Uh, and um, I had never heard of a school for taxi drivers before, so I stopped and went in and asked uh, uh, the person in the office whether I could come by sometime and, and shoot his course for taxi drivers, and he said, yes, there's a class beginning in 20 minutes, and uh, it, it turned out to be one of the funniest sequences I've had in any of the films, but it was just sheer chance that I saw the sign took the risk, stopped, uh, had no idea what, what was going to happen, and uh, lucked out. Uh, and that is uh, characteristic of, of all the films, and I think an element of the technique, really, because you have to be prepared uh, to shoot whatever is going on. You have to act very quickly. You have to make up your mind very quickly that it's worth shooting, and then take the risk of shooting it. And one of the reasons that a lot of uh, film is shot uh, now whatever it's called, new the films are shot uh, on digital cameras. I, I always forget what that's called. It's no longer called film. Uh, and um, it, you have to shoot a lot in order to have some choice in the editing room. Uh, because if you don't have the shots six months later in the editing room, I tear what's left of my hair out because I, uh, I don't have the shot. So it's better. It, for my kind of filming, it's better to overshoot rather than undershoot, so you have the choice uh, in the editing. And then uh, when the film is finished, uh, 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 a couple of months before the film is finished, I start thinking about the next film uh, to avoid the postpartum depression that sets in uh, when, uh, when I've finished. 
And so I've been sort of continuing like that, fighting off depression by making another movie uh, for the last uh, 50 years. Uh, um, and that, that's really the technique uh, and the experience. Uh, making these movies is a great adventure. Uh, and one of the greatest of adventures was when I made a film called Near Death in a, the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. It's a film about how decisions are made to stop treating uh, dying patients. Uh, and uh, it's really, in an abstract sense, it's a film about democracy because it shows that the doctors and nurses and family members and the person that was dying all participated in the decision making. And the person was kept alive until there was a recognition either on the person's part, or on the patient's part, or on the family's part that there no more help was offered or no, no additional help wouldn't do any good. So in an abstract sense, it's a movie about uh, democratic decision making. Um, but after the, uh, on the last day of shooting, I went around thanking the people who had, had helped me. Uh, and some of the sequences were shot in the morgue. Uh, and I, I looked around for the man who was in charge of the morgue and um, uh, finally found him in the cafeteria of the hospital. And, I thanked him and uh, I said I appreciated his help. And he shook my hand very warmly and said, see you soon. Uh, 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 and uh, so I think, uh, thank you very much for the degree and see you soon.